Oh, wow. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. I uh, really love being here in Austin. I've only had uh, three tacos so far in 48 hours here, so I feel like I'm letting myself down a little bit. Um, but I'm here to talk about, well, I guess I'll say I had a very strange uh, 2012 where, uh, where we make predictions, I make predictions, I use the we sometimes for 538 um, of upcoming elections, and it happened that this year we got all 50 states right, although not by a lot, where Florida, we had Obama with a 50.3% chance of winning, so it's a coin flip, and that coin flip turned out really well. Um, but I don't think this is anything all that amazing that we're doing, necessarily. Uh, we're just taking polls and using publicly available data to try and improve on what, might you, get, might, what you might get from the pundits, um, but it's nothing all that revolutionary, really. And yet it seemed to capture the attention of everyone in, in the media in a way that was really kind of out of proportion. So here's one demonstration of that, where this is Google search trends uh, over the course of the past year. So I had one week where I actually was getting more search traffic than, than the vice president. But people didn't totally lose their shit because Justin Bieber still <laughs> totally <laughs> dominated us both by an order of magnitude. Um, but it still was quite strange because, as I said, um, the 538 method, yeah, there, there are complicated parts of it. But basically, it's just a matter of, of can you average the polls? Can you count up to 270, the number of votes you need to clinch the Electoral College? And then and the third part is accounting for the margin of error. Um, that third part is a little trickier, actually, um, learning how to think in terms of probabilities, learning how to measure how much error you might have. I'm not going to talk a lot about that today, but that's a really critical step. But the first two parts in particular are not all that complicated to demonstrate. For example, here's the projections from Real Clear Politics, which uses a much simpler method than we do. They're just taking an average of the polls the past week before the campaign. And they didn't get 50 out of 50, but they got 49 out of 50. There were other sites run by political scientists and academics who got anywhere from 48 to 50 out of 50 states right. Um, so for me, this was. Uh, it was personally wound up being very nerve-wracking and then a lot of fun. Um, but it bothered me that this was such a big deal, that the bar was, was so low for coverage in politics that this relatively simple technique um, was producing so much bandwidth and, and so much controversy, really. Where if I go to, I went to the TED conference, for example, last week, and they have 15-year-olds uh, you know, who are trying to cure cancer and people who are trying to uh, bring uh, uh, extinct species back to life. And I think taking an average of the polls should not really be on that same plateau, <laughs> necessarily. Um, but you know, I have thought about these problems of, of predictability and how analytics are used or, or misused in different cases. Um, and in some sense, the fact that, that this relatively simple prediction caused so much uh, controversy is, is part of a larger story um, about difficulty that society is having predicting really big things. So here are a silly kind of triptych of, of images, but um, from hurricanes to earthquakes to financial collapses um, to flu to, to, to September 11th, we've had um, kind of a bad decade or so. We've been off to a bad start so far, I think, in the new millennium. So I call this uh, big data, big problems. Um, you can look at different ways to measure progress. One standard one is to look at gross domestic product growth or, or economic performance. So what you have here is the right arrow. The top arrow shows what GDP would be if the economy were, fu were fully functional right now, using all of its productive capacity. Um, the blue line says what's actually happened instead. So we know we had a big financial crisis a few years ago. What's troubling, though, um, is that we haven't really recovered and made up the lost productivity. We're still well below our productive potential as a nation. Um, and you can also look at this in a different way, where it might seem like, well, I'm making fun of, of the media and so forth, and I do do a little bit of that. Um, but we also have problems in, in science, where in 2005, I think it was, um, a, a researcher named John Ioannidis published a, a paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. And he was looking at high prestige journals and medicine and other disciplines and made a prediction based on kind of an application of Bayes' theorem that, um, that of all the hypotheses deemed to be true and statistically significant, in these journals that, that most of them were actually false and would not um, make good predictions, would not, could not be verified again. Um, this result, though, has proven to be true, where Bayer Laboratories has, has run tests on positive findings in, in medical journals, tried to recreate those experiments, and found that two-thirds of them fail upon a repeated trial. So we have a real crisis, I think, of, of science. You have, uh, you have big data, but this is, by the way, a picture of the uh, Politico's editorial board meeting. Um, but why isn't big data producing big progress is kind of the question that I've become more interested in. 
Um, and there are a lot of answers to this. I'm going to start out with a little bit of historical background. Again, it's not a simple uh, one-step fix that we're going to have, but um, to give you some context here. So um, here you have the growth in, in information. The World Wide Web was invented in 1990. There are other ways to represent big data, where IBM claims that 90% uh, of the data in the universe was created in the last uh, in the last two years. 70% um, of that, unfortunately, is remixes of the Harlem Shake. Um, <laughs> but there is some useful stuff out there as well. But this is not the first time, historically, as a species, that we've had um, a big uh, upward ramp, a big hockey stick in the amount of information that we had at our disposal. So um, here you see a graph going back to 600 AD with the number of books that were in circulation before and after the printing press was created in 1440. Um, so you have the same exponential growth curve, um, and this printing press really spread very rapidly throughout Europe. So even by kind of modern standards, you have technology where it was in just one city in Germany in 1450, and 50 years later, it was very, very widespread. Instead of it requiring about $20,000 to produce a manuscript of a book, you could do it for about $200 instead. So books were still relatively expensive by today's standards, um, but you finally had a technology that, that would allow us to record information and, and make gains as a society. Um, so, so what happened in the first 100 years or so after the printing press became widespread? Um, you did have some ideas the, uh, uh, that were spreading and science was progressing, but you also had a lot of war. Um, you had the English Civil War, the Thirty Years' War, the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, this was the bloodiest century in European history. Despite people having more information at their disposal, what happened is that they had more disagreement, really, where if you have a societal consensus, because there's no way to write information down, you have more harmony. When you have um, say Protestantism emerging because you can print 200,000 copies of Luther's theses, then you have a lot more to disagree about. Um, so in the short term, um, there's a happy story down the line, but in the short term, more information produced more conflict and more problems. Um, so I do liken this to, to things that are going on today where you see more and more clashes between uh, different partisans in the Congress or around the country. Um, this is a graph, uh, kind of a geeky graph, but from a system called DW Nominate that measures polarization in the U.S. Congress. So we set um, a record last year, actually. We had the most polarized Congress in American history. We also had the least productive Congress in American history. Um, so you have seen a, an uptick in polarization um, over the past 20 or 30 years. If you kind of look at this graph and see there's kind of an inflection point that begins, oh, around 1980, that's when cable news came into existence. CNN was born in 1980. In 96, you have another inflection point when MSNBC and Fox News came into being. Um, so I am simplifying the story a little bit. Obviously, this is a, a phenomenon that has several different causes. Um, but you do see a relationship between the way that people are consuming information and the beliefs they held. And instead of getting consensus where people have access to more data, um, you have more conflict and partisanship instead. Um, it really shouldn't be too much of a surprise why, where this is data from um, from Pew Research on the audience profiles of different, uh, of different news brands and nightly shows. So Rachel Maddow's audience, um, only 1% of her audience is Republican. Sean Hannity, only about 5% of Democrats, um, for some reason, decide to watch Sean Hannity on a given evening. Um, so you're really having people consume the news, consume media in ways that are different from one another and don't overlap with one another very much at all. Um, so what happens when you, get more, when you get more data? You have more different pieces of information to consume. Um, first of all, you definitely can't consume all of it. Um, I spend a lot of my time trying to keep up with blogs and newspapers and magazines and books, and you get only a fraction of that each day. Um, but what a lot of people do um, is only cherry pick the results that they find, uh, they find most uh, pleasing to their partisan sensibilities. So this is kind of a silly representation of it. Um, but so for example, imagine that in the last three weeks of the campaign that you were literally just cherry picking the three best polls in each state for Obama or for Romney and you wind up with two very different images of how the election would have looked like, where if you're looking only at Romney's best polls, you have him just narrowly winning the Electoral College. If you have Obama, if his best polls instead are what you're looking at, you have um, not quite a landslide, but a very, very clear margin of victory. Um, and it might seem as though um, no one is really so bad about only looking at one poll out of 20, at only looking at the outliers um, and missing the big picture, but there are websites like the Drudge Report, for example, which do exactly this. Um, so you might not be able to read 
read the individual headlines here. But what I've done, this is their web page at 6.30 a.m. on November 6, 2012, so election morning, basically. And by this point, you've seen an uptick in the polls toward Obama because of uh, Hurricane Sandy. The election really broke toward him at the last minute. Um, but every story I've highlighted in red here on the Drudge Report is a story that presented a favorable presentation of polling other data for Romney. So if you read this, is, if this is your main news source, you'd actually wake up on election day thinking that Romney is bound to win. Um, Drudge only cites a couple of data points where you have, um, he mentions the AP Washington Post poll, one poll out of three that he cites when really, um, really there are 20 polls that show Obama ahead in other key states. The other interesting part, by the way, are the columns I've highlighted in yellow here, or circled in yellow. Um, these are stories that Drudge is linked to about potential election fraud. Um, where, oh, the Black Panthers are, are gathering in Philadelphia, and, and will the media report on the results fairly? Will military votes be counted? Um, and so on the one hand, he's telling you that, well, um, Romney's going to win. You've got nothing to worry about. On the other hand, he's already building him an excuse in case Romney's wrong, where, no, if, if uh, either Romney wins or the Democrats cheated is the message that he wants to get out. Um, fortunately, on election day, we had a big enough margin where it was called early enough that you didn't have a lot of these disputes. Um, but this is an example of what some people call epistemic closure, where um, we provide no way for yourself uh, to be wrong, at least in your own kind of subjective space. Of course, it also means you have no way to really accommodate new facts, new information to do any, any real learning instead. Um, but lest you think I only want to tweak uh, political partisans and the media, and again, there's a lot to criticize there. Um, as I said before, we also are having problems in, in academia, in science, um, in business. So let me give you a bit of a kind of Debbie Downer story about what happens when we get more information. Um, so this is a, a silly representation of, imagine that these five blue blobs are five different variables that you're looking at, and if you're running a hypothesis test on any combination of two of these variables, then you have 10 relationships to test here. Um, so what happens when, when you double the amount of data? Well, that's great. So now you have 45 hypotheses to test. And now if you scale this up, so the, uh, the Federal Reserve's website now gives us information on 61,000 economic variables. So just running a two-way hypothesis test gives you about 1.86 billion possible relationships to check. Um, but is this really producing more meaningful relationships? One way I've heard big data described is that, well, we have more and more correlations, so we don't actually have to look for causality. I think that's a, a very big mistake. Um, what tends to happen in reality is that the new information you get has some value, so you do get more true signals, I would call it, um, but you also get a lot more spurious relationships where you have redundant data, data which might be robust in one dimension but, but not another. Um, so you have, even though you're getting more knowledge in an absolute sense, you have a bigger gap between what we think we know, we think all these correlations that show up in the data are meaningful when a lot of them are, are spurious, a lot of them don't really predict anything down the road, and what we really know. So this gap might be widening, the signal to noise ratio might be getting worse uh, instead of better. Um, the other problem that we as human beings tend to have is that we do have these kind of monkey cave band brains still very much where we are as a species advantage because we tend to make decisions very, very quickly. If you see, for example, um, if you're a caveman, you hear a rustling in the wind over yonder. We're trained to do a lot of pattern recognition and come to a very quick snap judgment about is this a real threat? Is it a lion that could attack my family? Or is it just rustling in the wind? Um, but when we're, pre when we're presented with so much information as we have in the world today, we tend to be oversensitive to essentially random fluctuations in the data, and we can misperceive random fluctuations and mistake them for, for real relationships or real patterns or real signals. So this is a, a classic example adopted from, uh, from a book called A Random Walk Down Wall Street, um, where the professor there would have his students generate random stock market charts by flipping coins um, and then show them to technical analysts on Wall Street, and the technical analyst would, would tell them to buy the stock immediately or, or dump it, whatever else. He was looking at totally random data and making up stories and narratives to go along with it. Um, by the way, if you are playing along at home, then DNF are real charts here, whereas the other four are fake. I made them on my computer by generating um, ones and zeros instead of flipping a coin. 
Um, but we really like to uh, make a lot of hay out of random noise. You see a lot of this in sports coverage, in political coverage. Um, we like to tell stories. And here I have to be a little bit careful because stories are a very effective and important way to communicate. This talk is full of little stories. The book, my book's full of little stories. You have to, we learn by analogy and metaphor a lot of the time. At the same time, you have to make sure that the stories you tell are representative of, of a bigger picture and that they testify to the truth and don't tell you about the outlying case. It's actually the distraction from, from, from the signal you're trying to find. Um, uh, so some people think, well, if human beings have so many biases, we can just kind of automate everything and have computers do everything instead. And you certainly have computer programs that do a lot of really remarkable things. Um, one landmark came in 1997. I'm not a chess player myself. I'm kind of a, a poker guy. I like, the, I like the randomness of poker and backgammon and games like that. Um, but if you're a poker player, you'll see a match between Gary Kasparov, the best chess player of all time. He's playing the white pieces and Deep Blue. IBM supercomputer who's playing the black pieces here. And if you're a good chess player, you'll know which player has the advantage here. Um, what's interesting, though, is that the way that Deep Blue might look at this position is very different from the way that, um, that a human like Kasparov might. So, so Deep Blue has a set of heuristics or shortcuts that allow it to evaluate the strength of a position. And in chess, there are kind of standardized values attached to different types of pieces. So for example, um, a knight is worth three times more roughly than a pawn. A rook is worth five times more, et cetera, et cetera. So Deep Blue can run these numbers and say, well, I'm counting my pieces up. I have fewer, actually, but they're more valuable. So I have 30 points. Kasparov is 29. I'm ahead. I'm probably going to win. Whereas Kasparov instead sees the board in terms of, of relationships, um, where he looks at his position and says, well, I might have less material strength, um, but look at what's happening to Deep Blue, where if you lose your, if you lose your king in chess, if you're checkmated, then, then nothing else matters. And he has three pawns bearing down on this one weakness in Deep Blue's defense. He has his bishop and his queen, which can, um, which can uh, uh, move diagonally very quickly. So in fact, Deep Blue's position is very dire. He's lost sight, um, or it, I should say, has lost sight of the bigger picture of the strategic goals while, while trying to find too much relation, or not finding enough, excuse me, uh, true signal in the data. Um, there is an amusing uh, side note to this story, though. This is, again, from, from game one of the match between Deep Blue and Kasparov. This was the only game that Kasparov won in their six-game match. Um, this is a position later on in the same game where, uh, where Deep Blue, again, has the black pieces. Computers don't get tired. They don't have pride. So they'll keep playing on, even when the position's really, really desperate to hope that Kasparov makes some catastrophic mistake. Um, but this is very late in the game where Deep Blue makes a move that looks like a random bug, where it moves its, uh, its rook from the square labeled d5 to d1 instead. Um, Kasparov can't figure out what this move accomplishes. Deep Blue is under threat from, from all sides, and it's essentially just kind of punted and wasted a turn. Um, but Kasparov goes back and, and thinks about it, and he says, I'm Gary Kasparov, um, and I can think supposedly 15 moves ahead. Um, and so if Deep Blue um, made this move that I don't understand, therefore that must demonstrate that Deep Blue can think even beyond me, that Deep Blue has evolved beyond what any human can compute, um, and what looks like a random error must really be a, a, a sign of superior intelligence. Um, but I talked to Deep Blue's programmers, the, uh, the lead named Murray Campbell at IBM in running my book, um, and he told me that, that what looked like a random bug actually just was a random bug, where in chess, you're on a clock. If you, run out of, if you run out of time, then you forfeit, you resign your position. So they had a fail safe in their code, a good thing to do, by the way, where if, if it hit a glitch, then it would randomly default to making a random legal move. So it wouldn't forfeit by running out of time. Um, and so that's all this was. But instead, Kasparov misperceived it as a sign of, of deep genius. He played very defensively throughout the rest of the match. In the second game, he resigned a position where he probably could have gotten a draw um, and then just wasn't playing his normal attacking style and wound up losing to Deep Blue over six games. Um, Kasparov was probably still a little bit better than Deep Blue then if they had played enough matches where Kasparov's condition was, was right. Um, but he wasn't in the right mindset because he gave too much credit to this, this very uh, well design computer program. Um, but this is a problem that comes up quite a bit, where you might have a technology that's claiming to have used data, crunch data, in a way that provides, uh, provides a lot of signal, when really it's just picking up on, on a bug. So this happened to me actually just this past week, where um, I moved to, to Manhattan. There were too many cool people moving to Brooklyn, so I had to move back to, to Manhattan instead. Uh, 
But I live now uh, roughly near Penn Station in Manhattan on 30th and 7th and had an event I had to get to at the Guggenheim. So the street grid in Manhattan is, in fact, a grid. It should not be that hard to get to, from point A to point B. And I had a black car who was taking me there. Um, so this is the route that Google, Google Maps would recommend, where you just kind of zag down 30th, and then you have to worry a little bit about the one-way streets. But you're going up Madison Avenue and then cross over. Um, and this is the route that my, that my uh, black car driver took instead. And I was observing him, and he was a nice guy, and, and very religiously following what his GPS was telling him to do. So how the GPS wind up with this result instead? Um, well, the reason why is there is within Central Park, as you see here, um, a road called East Drive. Um, and you see it would kind of represent a really nice shortcut through the midtown traffic. Um, but there was only one problem here, which is that the, the, the computer, again, the GPS wanted him to keep going down this red road. Um, and it had no traffic at all. So it said, well, this is a really good arbitrage here. It might be a little longer as the crow flies, but you'll save a lot of time. Um, the problem is the reason why there was no traffic on the red road is because it was closed. Uh, so really, it was trying to, to leverage, um, uh, leverage the fact that this road was closed and that uh, there was a reason why you had this false signal, in other words. Um, so I think we have to be careful when we have a pretty good intuition about how to get somewhere. Um, for example, the, the cab driver's intuition would be pretty good. And the other ironic part of the story is that if you had someone who's using their common sense, then they would say, well, you would never want to go back through Central Park three times. I think sometimes um, we probably all know people who, who when they get a map on their phone or they, they like lose anybody to like actually negotiate the real world. And here's a case where you see actually uh, technology making our decision making a little bit worse. Um, so, so why am I being skeptical here in an audience full of, of tech geeks who for the most part, um, who for the most part I would agree with on, on most factors? Um, I do just want to remind people that, that progress in society is tough. It's tough to make a living running a business. And so I want to present two kind of takes that I think are, are optimistic in, in a way, one from a macro view and one from, from a micro view. Um, so in general, when you're looking, when you're working toward any type of analytical problem, especially those involving numbers, um, you have diminishing returns. You have a learning curve where if you just get a few basic things right, then you get a pretty long way. And then as you add more complexity and add more variables to your model, it might improve your situation some, but, but not at the same rapid pace that you had before. Um, uh, the problem is that in a lot of fields where, where you have a lot of analytics already, that the water level of the competition is pretty high. What I've tried to do is work in fields like politics and baseball, where, uh, where the competition was not very good. There, by just being pretty good, you can get a long way. But if you're in a very competitive industry, then even though you're encountering diminishing returns, and even though um, you're just making marginal improvements, all your profit or your competitive advantage might come from that marginal gain. When I played poker, for example, um, uh, you very much learn that even though you get a lot better at poker for the first year or two after you play and stop just making the basics of, of folding your bad hands and betting with your good hands and bluffing a little bit, um, it takes a lifetime to master poker. And and it's very hard for all but the very elite set of players to actually win relative to tough competition. Um, but this is a happy story in the end, um, where I know we're in an economic slump right now, as I mentioned. But if you really zoom out and look at uh, economic growth over the whole world over the past 1,000 years or so, you see a very different story, where you see there, uh, for, for much of human history, there was really no economic progress at all. People don't realize that before about 1775, um, there was almost no improvement in the standard of living. You did have some population growth, but we weren't producing enough excess capacity, excess tech growth to do anything other than, than feed a few more people, but not in any better conditions. Um, and ever since about 1775, we We've had exponential growth. So yes, um, there are depressions and recessions, a lot of terrible things that happen. But, but the combination of, of technology um, with, with competition in the form of, of capitalism, uh, with ingenuity and everything else, has produced um, a lot of dividends for society economically and otherwise. But I do want you to know that there's about a 330-year gap between when, when the printing press was invented and you had this capacity to have, first of all, you had more information and a way to record and improve upon society's store of knowledge and when that te te technology produced uh, tangible dividends for, for society. Um, and so I think we have to, um, this is a quote from, from Michael Babiak, who's a PhD at Duke. Um, in science, we seek to balance curiosity with skepticism. I see a lot of curiosity in this room and at, the, at this conference. That's really great. Um, but we should understand that it's, it's hard work to take this big data and turn it into big progress. Um, thank you very much.
All right, thank you all again for coming. We are now going to switch to audience Q&A, powered by our friends in the back with mass relevance. Uh, so just a reminder, you can just tweet to hashtag AskSilver, and we will filter through your questions and pick the best ones and have them answer them. So our first question comes from Randy Crum, and he says, Nate, what areas do you find statistically unpredictable? Well, I think predictability exists along a spectrum and, and not in absolutes. Um, we had um, a formula that tries to predict the Oscars, and we've run this for a few years now and only gotten about 70% right. Um, that's a case where you don't really have a lot of good publicly available data. Um, what we try and do is use precursor awards. So for example, um, the Screen Actors Guild has a lot of overlap with people who actually vote in the Academy Awards. So it's almost like a poll where you're looking at a sample of the Academy, but still a highly imperfect sample. So there's some areas like that where um, we don't have a lot of data at all. And to pretend that you're going to make perfect predictions is usually quite, quite foolhardy. Zach asks, what are your favorite analytical tools? Um, so for most of the stuff that I do on, uh, on 538, I just use uh, Stata, or some people say Stata. I'm not sure which is right. Um, you know, I do think in general, though, that it's more about the, uh, the attitudes that you're adopting um, and less about having a particular type of, of regression analysis or, or whatever else. If you, if you have the right approach toward a problem, you know what you want to do. Um, and you have a good, honest ability to say, we're going to find what the data presents to us and, and not um, exaggerate what it says, um, then, uh, then I think that's where you make progress, not from having a different methodology, per se. So speaking of attitudes, uh, actually, what I am sort of curious as to what led you into this venture. I mean, where did it come from? You just decided to look into baseball statistics, or what happened there? So I think partly, I, I mean, Initially, uh, when I was kind of a 10-year-old, I like, really wanted to win my fantasy baseball league. Um, and I kept drafting like Ruben Sierra and people, like really crappy players, and not understanding why my team always failed to win. Um, so that was my kind of first introduction to start reading Bill James. And in, in baseball, this stuff really was, uh, you had the Moneyball revolution take place kind of in the early 2000s, so to speak. But, um, but you did have pioneers well before that. Um, but it's, you know, it's often been about, about competition, about wanting to win my NCAA tournament pool or, or my fantasy baseball league, um, or about having a product out there that I thought was not very good, where one thing that my baseball projection system did was um, to forecast a range of outcomes. So instead of saying, here's what the guy's going to do exactly, it has a probability distribution instead. Um, so because that product didn't exist, I kind of felt like I had to, I had to make it myself. Um, and sometimes it's easier to do something yourself, and it's very motivating than, um, than to wait around for someone else to do it instead. Okay. All right, Josh Kirby asks, with the amount of data growing exponentially, will good data last and bad data fall away over time? So in the long run, we do make uh, progress in science, um, where that curve, if you just kind of filter out and zoom out to 30,000 feet, you are seeing advances in society. So yeah, you do have a, a survival of the fittest process, and that's part of what science is. It's also very messy in the way there, um, where you can have whole beliefs that turn out to be wrong, whole theories, whole paradigms every now and then that need to be shifted. Um, so as long as we don't become too stubborn about, uh, about assuming that whatever we think from our point of view is, is going to be right as we gain more knowledge, then we will keep making progress. But it gets, uh, it gets messy along the way. Okay. Linda Waste asks, who should play you in the sure-to-be box office hit about your life? I really hope they don't make a, a movie about me. Uh, but, uh, but I don't know. Uh, I, would, I would think Brad Pitt, you know, in terms of appearances. <laughs> But I'm not sure if that's the way that, that Hollywood would go. <laughs> um, so if you had sort of six months or a year or just a significant amount of time uh, to devote to predicting something next, what would that be? Um, so again, I like to think about areas where, where you might have a low level of competition. And so I think maybe areas involving the public sector. So for example, yesterday I went to a panel about using analytics to um, help predict rates of prison recidivism. I can't say that word. But, uh, but which prisoners can you release into society and have them be um, rehabilitated and also have them not be a threat to commit crime again? Um, and that might be, you know, there are all kinds of ethical and legal implications there. Um, it's maybe a complicated thing. But the fact is that I would imagine that the California Parole Board or whatever is not looking at any kind of analytics at all. So there you can make maybe a lot of marginal gains to society by, by doing just a little bit. Um, so again, I think about areas like, like education, where you do see more and more data being used. 
I'm skeptical that all that data is being used in a very constructive way. Um, you can look toward things like urban planning, where governments like New York City under Bloomberg is collecting more and more data, but, um, but sometimes it's not being used because you, you encounter a lot of bureaucracy um, and, and kind of uh, sclerotic systems along the way. So areas like that, I think, at least in terms of social benefit, might be, might be very interesting. Christopher McCauley asks, does interviewing and emotional intelligence play a role in your predictive work? Um, so, I mean, I did a lot of interviews for, for my book, um, but, uh, but in general, I think, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, in general, I think this kind of question maybe gets at uh, to what extent is a, do you want to intervene and say, well, I have a model, but I'm going to override my model and make a judgment based on, on my gut feel or my subjective view instead? Um, my thoughts on that subject are, are somewhat complicated. I certainly, in general, default toward taking your model and sticking with it. I think if you're going to make a claim to have something which is objective, and if you're always tinkering with results uh, because you don't like what it's saying, then, um, then you lose a lot of the benefit that you might have had in the first place. At the same time, there are some examples where, where if you use a model as a baseline, the judgment can improve it. So for example, in the book, I talk about um, this money ball conflict between, between stats and, and scouts, um, where scouts take more subjective views of players. Um, but what I found is that if you look at the long-term performance of players who are rated highly by the program that I designed versus the ones the scouts rate highly instead, the scouts actually do a little bit better than, than the math-based method alone there. And the reason why is that um, the, scouts now, the, 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 the scouts now are very well versed in the basics of analytics, so they're not going to take a guy who's hitting 220 with, uh, with five home runs and say he's going to be a huge power hitter. But between two otherwise about equal players, they can add some value, a lot of value actually, in differentiating between them about knowing what the kid's work ethic might be like, um, knowing why a, a certain athlete might be struggling if they're having a bad time. Um, and so you can add value if you start with analytics as a baseline. If you instead take the view that um, I'm not going to listen to this numbers garbage at all, I'll just stick my finger in the wind, and that tends to end in disaster a lot of the time. Um, so if you have more of a merger between, uh, between subjective viewpoints and objective viewpoints, again, if you can actually make your intuition match more to what you would do. I mean, intuition is really kind of a, a time-saving device for the most part, where we don't have time every time we're trying to book a flight or pick a route to work or choose what sandwich to eat um, to go through and do a big analysis on a spreadsheet that will take hours and hours to do. Um, so we have to rely on, on quick heuristics uh, to make judgments instead. Um, but the more we can train ourselves to have, um, to have quick instincts, uh, when our quick thinking is more correlated with what we would do if we had more time to analyze a problem, then the better off uh, we'll be in the long run. Next question is, what's one way we can use big data to create big progress? Um, so I do think part of it is, uh, is toward having more data in public sector spheres like education, for example. Um, and I know there are some panels here on, on education and whatever else, um, but I do think it's, uh, you know, in general, I assume the more bureaucracy there is, bureaucracy is pretty much the opposite of, uh, of imagination. Um, so looking for, for industries that, uh, that you have low-hanging fruit, I think, is, is probably the most productive way to, to deploy analytics. Okay. Alana asks, what was the weirdest stat or bit of data you saw on the 2012 election? Sorry for my Marco Rubio moment here. Um, <laughs> so I was down in, uh, in, in Tampa, Florida for the Republican convention. And Tampa, unlike Austin, is not really one of my favorite cities exactly. Um, but I could tell you would move from different neighborhoods in Tampa. And you could tell you got a different feeling about what the politics were in the neighborhood. And so I tweeted something to the effect of, um, I bet that if a neighborhood has sidewalks, that's Democratic. And if it has no sidewalks, then it's, it's Republican. Um, and in fact, a polling firm, I think, called Merriman Research Group actually looked at that and found that 62% um, that or so of voters in neighborhoods that have sidewalks voted for Obama, and 65% of people without sidewalks voted for Romney instead, um, which might seem uh, like it's just a cute little thing. But one thing that's happening here is we become more, more polarized in our views is that politics is becoming kind of almost more of a lifestyle choice, really, where if you look, for example, at, at gun ownership rates, uh, 30 years ago, Democrats and Republicans had about the same number, or about equally likely to own guns. Whereas now, if you're a Republican, you're two and a half times more likely to own a gun. 
uh, than a Democrat. Um, what the cause and effect there might be is hard to say, which triggers the other one. But it is odd that this kind of relatively uh, minor, I'm not saying it's a minor social problem, but, but merely having a certain type of household objects makes you two and a half times more likely to be Republican than not having it. And it's, it's quite unusual and striking in a way. It makes me think that, um, that a lot of what we think of as being these kind of rational decisions about politics are really kind of um, uh, lifestyle choices, really, where the Obama campaign in 2008 was very good about promoting Obama as a, as a lifestyle brand. Um, they were also very good about using analytics on the back end for their voter targeting. Um, but that idea where we affiliate with different political groups because we kind of are making friends within those groups and we feel an affinity to them more than we're trying to do an analysis of, of who might help us personally, um, I think is a pretty uh, uh, important phenomenon. So what do you think your findings say about us as a society? Is it that you're just revealing trends that we sort of adhere to, or are you finding that you know, we're more of a predictable society? Is that what you're actually revealing? So uh, yeah, I think people sometimes, uh, sometimes mistake what I do and maybe the way that the election got portrayed as someone who's saying, well, everything is, is predictable. We can all boil it down to um, predicting what every, what every item, <clears throat> what every iota of matter will do. Um, whereas really I'm more, I'm something of a skeptic of prediction, um, not of the enterprise of trying to predict things. I think it's essential to science. Um, but usually prediction is, is pretty hard. And again, so I say what I'm doing in politics is not that complicated. We're just taking publicly available polls and averaging them. Um, and the fact that that scene is so remarkable says that maybe society has a long way to go in how it uses stats and math. Um, but there are lots of fields where we get ourselves in trouble by thinking there's more predictability than there really is. So um, economics is a classic example of this, where we basically have no ability. If you see a forecast of what economic growth will be, say, a year from now, um, that's never had any predictive power whatsoever. We're just guessing that the long-term average GDP growth rate beats any forecast which is more complicated or daring than that. Um, so really, I think that prediction has not gone <laughs> all that well in society. We're making slow progress in some fields and rapid progress in a, a small slice of fields. But, um, but it's a difficult thing. And so to assume that we're going to be on the verge of some kind of uh, big data singularity, I think, is, is a bit naive. All right, Shepard asks, you had an event yesterday titled, Is Intuitive Marketing Dead? What was the verdict? Um, you know, so what I tend to think, again, this is, gets back to the question about how good is intuition versus using an algorithm, in essence. Um, and part of it is looking at, is, does the algorithm do a good job or not? Um, there's evidence, for example, that if you're, um, if you're trying to pick a job candidate, um, that looking, doing an interview with a person and having a one-on-one -on -one interaction adds relatively little value relative to just doing it algorithmically based on, on what's on their resume and everything else. You might have a nice conversation with someone, but you might be picking up attributes that don't correlate very well with how good of an employee they might be over the next four or five years. Again, there are other cases where, um, like in baseball, ironically, you actually see some evidence that, um, that the stat, that, that stat heads do have value. But, but the most important theme here is just we want to have ways to, to test and measure and improve upon different approaches toward making decisions. Um, if you can actually set up an experiment where, where you have kind of the scouts on the one hand and the numbers on the other, then doing that kind of thing is great. You can refine your methods as you go along. Um, a lot of time, though, we're, we're very reluctant to actually test our ideas. We spend a lot of time uh, working on theories and building models and not running real world experiments based on, on real customers and, and real, making real predictions. So the more you can get out of model land and actually start um, running tests and experiments, uh, the better you can find what combination of kind of objective data and secret sauce might work best. <laughs> All right. Diane wants to know, why are the Chicago Cubs cursed? So there are some things that are, that are truly inexplicable in life, and the Cubs might be one of them. Um, but for a long time, actually, there was kind of an economic rationale behind this, which is that Cubs fans were too indifferent toward whether the team was any good or not. And they'd go and, and show up at Wrigley Field and, and drink beer no matter what and be in the bleachers and be happy. Um, so was, there was very little incentive for the Cubs to be any better. They would sell out the stadium either way. Um, so you finally have started to have at Wrigley Field um, more empty seats. And that, even more than Theo Epstein being hired, is probably a really good sign for the club. That now you're not getting the lovable losers anymore. The team is charging, you know, 60 bucks for, for a ticket. They better be good, and hopefully in the long run they'll finally have some, uh, some success. Okay. Tyler asks, with the data from Google's knowledge graph and Facebook's social graph, will predictions become more or less accurate? So 
in theory, uh, in theory, having more data can never can never hurt you. Of course, in the presentation, I went over some ways that, in practice, if we start to cherry pick our data too much, we can get ourselves in trouble if we start to look up for spurious correlations. But look. In the long run, having open data is going to be a tremendous thing for society. By the way, there are also a lot of ways in which um, maybe, for example, you don't have benefits to industry, but you do have improvements in quality of life that don't show up very well in things like GDP. Um, so for example, if you're in journalism right now, it's, it's really, really tough in a lot of ways. You have had a 25% reduction in the number of journalism jobs just in the past five years alone. Um, but having lots of free or cheap content um, is really good for, for a lot of readers and might make them better informed instead. Um, so I think these things are, are good for social welfare. Um, I don't necessarily think they'll, big, they'll produce big breakthroughs in the near term. I think it's going to take longer for society to get everything in place to start really mining that into uh, useful, useful knowledge and useful insights. Brian Walsh asks, how much confidence do you have in the ability of scientists to predict long-term climate change? Um, so there's a chapter in the book on, on climate change which kind of courted a lot of controversy. Um, what, what the chapter says is that climate change is one of those areas where we take a relatively simple scientific problem and people on all sides are adding a lot of complication to it. Where the simple part is just the physics of, of the greenhouse effect itself, which has been well understood for, for more than 100 years, where if, uh, if you have more carbon in the atmosphere, it traps more heat, radiates back onto the surface of the Earth, and so you have, you have global warming occur, other things being equal. Um, I think sometimes uh, the models can get themselves in trouble when they try and make overly specific predictions about what might happen 50 years down the road, or if you try and attribute specific uh, short-term climate events um, to climate change or to global warming, whereas just knowing that we have, uh, we have the planet warming over the long term in a way that's almost certainly caused by, by man-made greenhouse gas emissions and that the risks from that are asymmetrical and weighted to the downside, that alone ought to be enough to compel society to act. Now, how does it act is another very tricky question, but, um, but I think sometimes you have too much of a rat race to try and attribute every hurricane or every blizzard um, for and against global warming when, when we've understood the basics behind the science for, for a very long time and should kind of actually get on um, to have the debate about the economics of how we combat climate change instead. So what do you see as the true value of our ability to do this? Is there an end goal in mind, or are you, is your goal just an expository one? Um, you know, I mean, there are a lot of goals, right? You want to, you can try and, and make money for yourself. You can try and make money for your business. You can uh, try and improve society's welfare. You can try and just uh, pursue knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, you know, look, I do think one good thing about, uh, about having uh, a competition in the private sector is that you do have this competitive element take place. And competition in science and in industry is a very important driver of success. Um, when you, because it is so uncertain sometimes what method or what business approach might work until you're actually testing it out on real customers, having the ability to actually have a competition in the real world um, is very, very important. And whereas you might think that government might tend to focus on, on the problems that the private sector doesn't do very well because it can be too short-term focused sometimes. Um, so you might think in an ideal world you might have government making more, more long-term scientific investments and long-term research into infrastructure and education areas like that. Um, unfortunately, our politics have become very short-term focused as well. So whenever you have the budget being cut, you have discretionary spending is always on the chopping block, but that, the discretionary spending stuff is actually some of the best stuff. That includes basic research, that includes a lot of science and R&D and education. And, uh, and if we want to keep that, that GDP curve growing in the long term, then, um, then investing more into science is, is pretty essential. Okay, so the next question is, everybody asks you to predict. What's the strangest thing that you've ever been asked to predict? Um, I mean, there are all kinds of strange things. I, I got pitched one time by a guy who, uh, who works for a cricket team in India who thinks there can be kind of a money ball revolution in Indian cricket, and I wasn't like too excited about that one necessarily. Uh, but you know, people want to predict relationships, they want to predict all kinds of different things like what food trends are going to take off. And again, my stance is, is, is definitely not that you can take 
an algorithm or a formula and apply it to everything and come out with a meaningful result. I think this is a type of, of science. Um, it's a very new type of science in some ways. I like the term data scientist, but we're just trying to figure out um, what people like that might actually, might actually do. Um, we have to probably reform the way education works in the United States so we have more focus on probability and statistics and not as much maybe on, on calculus and kind of theory more on, on applied math. Um, and it's going to take a long time for that filter to filter all the way through uh, society, I think. Okay, Dave Hep asks, when you say we in your examples, I am curious, how big is your team and what roles do they play? So 538 is basically a, a two and a half person team, or three person, I should say, where it's me, my co-blogger, Micah Cohen, and, uh, and my editor is Megan Lieberman. Um, but we do get a lot of help from other people at the time. So um, if you've seen the Times website, any kind of graphic and interactive design they do, I think it's probably they're the best in the world at doing that, and they provide a ton of help in making sure the content looks good. It's really important, by the way, to be able to visualize data. Um, a lot of times, that things that are very hard to express through the written word or through a table um, become very easy to see through charts and graphs. So making that data visually relevant, and these people that work for the Times really are journalists, meaning they are, are trying to um, distill the essential truth from a set of information and, and help that inform the public um, is very valuable as well. But the we, the team is not actually all that big. We're, uh, we're hopefully thinking about expanding 538 to cover more fields in the future. Um, but at the same time, I think if you expand too much, you might lose some of what makes 538 special and distinct. Okay, Elizabeth asks, when do you use intuition versus data in your life? Um, so I use intuition all the time, I guess, to kind of make, uh, to make small decisions, so to speak. And for making bigger decisions, you have to step back and, 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 uh, and think slowly, I guess, as Daniel Kahneman would put it. Um, so believe me, I don't really like, spend all that much time trying to analyze like, which burrito. Actually, I did that for, for a couple of years. I had a blog about which burrito in Chicago was best. But, but that being an exception, for the most part, uh, you're trying to just get along in everyday life. And, and uh, whereas if you're thinking about, for example, um, what job to take, or what about the future of 538, or how do you want to devote your time, or a relationship, or whatever else, um, you can definitely not boil that all the way down to a spreadsheet. I'm just saying you should take more time to think through that problem from, from all different kinds of approaches, um, instead of trying to make a snap decision and assuming that that's going to be as productive as if you invest more time into considering a problem. All right. Togo asks, given a certain set of data, do you think it will be possible to predict the path of a person's future? Um, I, 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 one thing that I found interesting is at my, at my first job out of college, I was a, a consultant for an accounting firm called KPMG. Um, and most of my work was like quite dreadfully boring. Uh, but we did have one project where, um, where we were working with the state of Ohio uh, to monitor um, technology use in public school classrooms in the fourth grade and the sixth grade. So we'd uh, go actually observe classrooms in Toledo or, or somewhere in rural Ohio, for example, um, and see what the kids were doing. Um, and I don't have kids myself, but, um, but seeing what a fourth grade classroom behaves like is, is incredibly fascinating, I think, um, where you see that some kids, you, can, you think you can tell, I guess we can't experiment on this, but you, you, you can tell which kids are occupying a disproportionate amount of the teacher's bandwidth. You can see which kids seem as though they'll become problematic. Um, now, I don't know, again, how much that tracks between experience in elementary school or middle school and, and how much success you have later on in life. But again, this all exists along, along a spectrum um, instead of in absolutes. Um, and, uh, and so you know, I think it might, you know, part of education is to, is to try and uh, think about which kids will have the best outcomes, but also which interventions will, will produce a greater outcome for a greater number of children as well. All right, the next one, <laughs> I was waiting for it to come up. Uh, <laughs> do you have any tips on a good prediction system for March Madness? Yeah, so we actually run predictions at 538 every year on the tournament. So like most things that I try and do, they're, um, they're probabilistic instead of having just one bracket that we put out. Um, but we found, for example, that, uh, that if any of you have come from across the country and are jet lagged here, um, travel distance matters a lot to performance. Um, and so if you have a team, say Gonzaga, is put in the, in the regional in North Carolina, um, that hurts them by the equivalent of about three or four points. It's as, though, it's as though they're playing a road game instead of a neutral court game as well. Um, so we have a relatively straightforward formula that looks at, um, looks at different power ratings, um, plus the seeds, um, plus travel distance and, and injuries, and, and runs the bracket and simulates that as a result. But yeah, go to 538 is the answer for, for all your NCAA tournament needs. <laughs> 
All right, Mackenzie wants to know, do you find value in using social media for data analysis? Um, I, think there, I think there can be some, um, some benefit here. So for example, I know during, uh, during the Democratic Convention, you had Obama and Michelle Obama um, and Bill Clinton trending a lot more than, uh, than any Republican did during the GOP convention instead, and that eventually translated into a bigger boost in the polls for, for Obama instead of the GOP. At the same time, there have also been studies suggesting that, for example, the people in this room, uh, uh, we are unfortunately not very representative of America as a whole. Uh, people on Twitter are not very representative of America as a whole. They're much better informed. They're somewhat left to libertarian leaning. Um, they're much more high income on average. They're much younger. Um, they're much more urban. Uh, so we have to be careful about saying that uh, we're not too much in our own bubble where, where what this community might think necessarily represents what, what the broader public opinion might be. At the same time, um, the fact that you can have things occur in, in real time and the fact that we're going to get better, I think, as we're more used to understanding what the biases are, say, for example, and Twitter coverage, maybe adjusting for those, and I think you'll, you'll see some real insight from, coming, uh, from that coming down the road. Okay, John Nearland asks, who is your favorite Nate Silver critic? <laughs> I mean, you know, I get in a lot of exchanges with, uh, with political scientists, um, and these really are very nerdy fights about, about which economic variables uh, to use, and sometimes they've got, not personal exactly, but you know, very, very detailed and, and very heated. Um, but I think we realized, like once you got all the bullshit that happens during the middle of an election campaign, um, that we were all in it together, and I got messages from political scientists who I had, had kind of academic feuds with and said, look, you know, we're all in this together, and, and, and anything that we're doing is probably a lot better than what you get from, from listening to the mainstream media coverage or Morning Joe or something on a typical day instead. Um, and so I think, um, look, critique and disagreement is a very, very important part of, of making progress in science. Science very much is <clears throat> a messy field. Um, one problem that you have in political discourse is that um, if you kind of go back to, to John Stewart's appearance on, on Crossfire in 2004, which basically ended the show, thank God. Um, <laughs> But you had, you had disagreement, really, as, as theater, where you had the Republican stooge and the Democratic stooge that would never actually try and think through a problem. There was never any chance that Trevor Carlson would agree with the Democrats' point of view, or Paul Begala would agree and come down on the GOP side instead. Um, that's not how real debate and real science works. Real uh, debate means that you lose the argument some of the time as more data comes your way, and you acknowledge that you come to a consensus view over time and not have two warring factions that never agree on anything at all. Um, and so the big difference between, I think, the way like 538 looks at objectivity, and we see it as being, you know, having scientific objectivity just means that you're, you're trying to get at the truth, and you care about the world beyond yourself, and you think there is a truth out there to pursue, and that our subjective views of that truth are, are imperfect. Whereas in political objectivity means he said, she said, we're pissing each side off equally, so we must be doing something right. I think it's a very, very strange way to describe um, objectivity. And I think you know, journalism, especially in politics, is suffering a lot as a result. So in the political circles that you're a part of, do you feel a pressure to be right? I mean, there are definitely a lot of uh, financial rewards from being right, where it means that I get more traffic at 538, and I have more opportunity to give talks and, and to write books and things like that. Um, I mean, ironically, I think I probably am getting like, way too much credit now. Um, I said before the election that if, if Mitt Romney won and we gave him some probability of winning, it was a pretty close election, really. Um, that would get too much blame, but it would also get too much credit if, if Obama won instead. So it's another kind of issue we face is that, uh, is that we're very results-oriented as a society. Um, if you have a field where you have rapid feedback, so for example, in baseball, one reason the Moneyball revolution, so to speak, took hold very quickly is because you play games every day. Um, you have 750 players in the major leagues at any given time, so you have very, very quick feedback on, on your decisions on who is actually a better player, even though in the short run, there's certainly a lot of luck in baseball as well. Whereas in politics, if you're wrong um, on an election, then you have four years before you can fix that, or four years if you get lucky before you, you're proven unlucky in the end. So you have very, very, very slow progress in elections forecasting especially as well. And I think sometimes, again, people look too much at, at that one good night that we had November 6 instead of in the long term, what's our overall approach? What's the 538 process? Like I think that's really where, um, where I spend more time thinking about than, than what the results are. All right, Costa wants to know, what can entrepreneurs do to use big data for their startups? 
Um, so obviously, a lot of people in this room are using big data in a lot of different respects. I think you know, number one is thinking about, are you in a field where the competition of the water level is low, trying to invent a, a social media platform that's 98% the same as the other ones, but adds 2% of the margin? You're probably not going to make a lot of progress there necessarily. But looking for fields that have not been thought of in an analytic way before, but where you do have uh, data available, I think, is where you're more likely to make positive change. Um, at the same time, people should, should also realize that, um, that using analytics does not absolve you of the responsibility to have a good business culture, where if you just have a bunch of kind of stack geeks locked in the closet somewhere, and you have your suits on the other hand, that's not going to wind up going very well in the end. In kind of the first wave of when you start to have Major League Baseball teams employ stat heads, that's what you would what you would have is you had a stat who did not have a seat at the table. Um, but instead, if you have your data people understand what questions you're trying to answer and pose questions of their own in terms of what's going to help this business grow, what are my objectives, and you have also business people who are, who are conversant in the language of data and statistics, even if they're not running regression analyses themselves, then that's where you really see companies grow. One reason why startups often um, beat Big companies is because you have people who are more multidisciplinary, where you have people who both know the business and know the data and are very keep their ears very low to the ground, whereas when you have um, companies with too many bureaucratic um, holes, they become calcified. Instead, um, you have people who are not looking at the bigger picture, and so they suffer as a result. OK, and Nikhil asks, what data points should everyone know? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there are any actually helpful. Well, so I do, I do try to collect data on, uh, on travel a lot, because I fly a lot, and I don't like to be stuck in, in airports very much. Um, so don't fly out of J JFK Airport uh, in the evening in the summer is one travel tip, actually. And the reason why is that the system gets uh, clogged up throughout the day, where there are any delays in the system, they tend to manifest themselves in the New York and other busy airports. Um, and so if you fly out in the morning, I'm not a morning person, but that's often a lot better. You have no uh, chance for delays to have cascaded throughout the system. Um, that's probably not the most important data point in the history of civilization, but it's, I don't know, it just came to mind. OK, Amanda wants to know, you've said that you might stop publishing predictions if they sway outcomes. What's your threshold? Um, I'm not sure there's a. a uh, a bright line exactly. Um, and I should back up here and say that you know, media coverage in general can influence the way political events unfold. Um, so for example, during the GOP primaries, you had, uh, you had a poll come out about a week before the Iowa caucus that had Rick Santorum surging from 10% from of the vote to 16% of the vote. Um, now, the thing about this poll is that it was a CNN poll, and they do, they do fine polls, so I don't mean to critique them in particular. Um, but it was a small sample size. The margin of error was quite high, about plus or minus five or six points. Um, so this whole surge that Santorum had might have just been a fluke of, of sampling error. Um, but what happened is that is that 5:38 and CNN and everyone else began to uh, began to run stories about how Santorum was surging, and so voters who had previously backed Rick Perry and Michelle Bachman began to gravitate toward toward Santorum based on this initially spurious result that kind of became a self-fulfilling prophecy in the end. Um, so you worry again about um, about polls and media coverage influencing how voters behave, they're behaving tactically in primaries and so forth, and that actually affecting and kind of producing its own reality. Um, but I guess I would feel like if people, if you start to have people who, who were saying things like, I felt like I didn't have to vote because I looked at 538 instead, then that would be a really bad sign, I think. Um, in theory, you'd have kind of this sealed off world where you have 538 and one half of it, and then some parallel universe where, where voters are unaware of polls and predictions and are making um, voting decisions instead. But if, you, if, I, if I were to feel like people were, were not voting, um, or it were hurting the democratic process, then I would feel I'd probably go on and move to something else instead. All right, well, thank you for coming. Cool, thank you. Nate Silver. Thanks, Nate. Thank you.